Welcome everybody and thank you for joining for the first Quantum Materials workshop. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. My name is Helena and I'm the Quantum Materials Outreach Officer at the Department of Physics. Um, that means that I work with the Quantum Materials Research Group and I help them bring their exciting research to a wider audience, including all of you lovely people. So thank you for joining. Time to get started, I think. So the reason why you're all here is marvellous magnets. Okay, so speaking of magnets, I'm sure you've all seen one that looks a bit like this. So as you can see, this is a bar magnet, classic bar magnet you'll have probably seen in school, probably used them as well, maybe done some experiments, maybe picked up some paper clips, which is great. And you can see this has two ends. So we have the red end and the blue end. So these ends are called poles, so they're special names for magnets and we call them the North Pole and the South Pole. Okay, so typically the red is the North Pole and the blue is the South Pole. And the key thing with magnets is if we have two of them and we try and bring them together, we find that opposite poles attract, so we can see they're stuck together, and like poles repel. So I'm trying to push these together and you can see it's kind of making it go to the side and it's not quite sticking together. So opposites attract, like poles repel. Okay, so those are kind of the key things that we all need to know about magnets. But there's actually a lot more to them, which is what we're going to cover a little bit today. We're going to go through a few little demos, um, hopefully, and get a chance to explore magnetic fields a bit for yourself using a new website that we've got. So to get things started, in the chat hopefully you can all access the chat i'm going to ask you a question and i'd love for you to put your answers in the chat okay so what magnetic materials can you think of what things are magnets great so metals was an answer which is good but are all metals magnetic that's the question and i can see some answers here so the popular ones here, we've got iron, cobalt and nickel, some excellent answers. I can also see steel, which is correct. But the reason why steel is magnetic is it is because it contains iron. So at the core, we've got those three elements there, the iron, nickel and cobalt. OK, copper is not magnetic. Um, however, 2P coins are because they've got iron on the inside of them. So they're copper plated, but they've got iron on the inside. Gold is also not magnetic, although it's an excellent conductor of electricity. Okay, good. So the three, the three elements, at least at room temperature, that are commonly known as, as magnetic, the sort of magnetism that you will be used to, like these bar magnets, are iron, nickel, and cobalt. Okay, but actually, there are a few other things that are magnetic in different ways to what we might be used to. So some crystals can be magnetic. So I've got a lovely crystal here in this pot. It's a little bit dented and blurry, but you'll see it up close later. And this is copper sulfate. You might have come across this in school as well. Uh, but this is a blue crystal and I'm going to show you that it is actually magnetic, not in the conventional sense, but it is magnetic. And even to a certain extent, we as humans are magnetic. Okay. So more to that later. So just to start, I've got a few little samples here. So I've got a sample of nickel here just to prove that it is magnetic. I've got a magnet here, going to stick it on there. So this is quite a heavy lump of nickel. It's over 99% pure. So this is some of the good stuff here. You'll also find nickel in 5p pieces. So if you've got a 5p coin, you can test if that's magnetic. And I also, the magnet's stuck there. And I've also got a little sample here of cobalt. So this is staying in the pot because cobalt is actually a bit of an irritant and can be toxic, um, including if you inhale it. So I'm going to leave this in the pot, but I can prove that it's magnetic there. So you can see it's stuck, stuck there to the tin, to the plastic tub. There. So there's our cobalt. Uh, but we've actually been using and finding magnetic materials for thousands of years. So one of the first uh, things that we dug out of the ground was a, a magnetic rock called magnetite. Okay, so this I have an example of here. So it looks a bit like that. It's basically an iron oxide. So it's got iron in it, which is what makes it magnetic, as we can see there. 
and this magnetite just occurs naturally in the earth and has been dug out of the ground and it's named for a place called magnesia which is in Greece and we also have dug out of the ground little stones that look like this and these are called lodestones and these are actually naturally occurring magnets now they're quite weak but I can demonstrate them so I've got some paper clips that I'm just going to put on my table and the lodestones can actually pick up a few paper clips so I'm not holding it there so these are naturally occurring magnets in the ground, little rocks that we dig out. And we've been using these magnets, like I say, for thousands of years. So one of the first uses of magnets were compasses. So what I've got here is a really, really nice Chinese compass. And this little spoon has some lodestone in it. So those little naturally occurring magnets, and we can see it acts like a compass and I can show this a bit more I've just let me just set up my screen share and you can see a little bird's eye view of the magnet of the Chinese compass there okay so here we go so hopefully you can all see that so if I nudge it slightly you can see it wants to align back up just like a compass and that stick there the uh, pointy bit of the ladle is pointing towards north. So it's acting just like, or thereabouts. I've got a few of the strong magnets in the room that might be interacting with it a little bit, um, but more or less it's pointing north. And the same thing can be said, if I move that out of the way, for what we might know as a, as a modern compass here. So I've had to move the, uh, the Chinese compass out of the way because the the little magnetic material in here interacts with the magnet in the other compass so you would actually find that they start not pointing north and pointing towards each other instead see if i move them see how it moved there if i move them close that's their compasses and that's how we've been using magnets like i say for thousands of years and just like in modern compasses that we use to point north and navigate We've been using those lodestones in compasses too. So how do compasses work? So that's a very good question. And to understand how compasses work, we need to think of something called magnetic fields. So each magnet produces its own magnetic field. And that's basically the area over which the magnet can attract other magnets or magnetic things. So if you see, as I move the magnets close together, they don't have to be touching before it, it attracts the other magnet. And that's because of the magnetic field surrounding the magnet, okay? It doesn't extend forever, but it extends far enough that we call this acting at a distance. So it's a force acting at a distance, okay? And we can explore the magnetic field using something called a magnaprobe here. So all this is, is it's a little magnet on a pivot so it can move kind of all around in 360 degrees. And if we show the field for the magnet and we follow the magnet round, the magnet probe round, we can see how the field changes as we move around the magnet. Oh, it's a bit blurry there, I'll move that up and back the other way. There we go. And we can represent those fields using what we call field lines. So if I were to draw these on, I'm just going to rotate that round. We can draw the field lines, which look something a bit like this. Okay, so that was how the magnaprobe followed the magnetic field around. And we can draw more. So we have field lines around a bar magnet that look a bit like this. And as I've already said, we have the red end of the magnet, which is typically the north and the blue end, which is the south. And we draw the field lines so they go from the north to the south, just as I drew them there. And we put little arrows on them to show which is the north pole and which is the south pole. Okay, so from north to south. Okay, so going back to our earth and how compasses work, well, the earth is like a giant bar magnet. And so the compass that we have, let me move the magnet out of the way, 
And so our compass has a little magnet here with the red end being the north pole of the magnet again. And the magnet in our compass, it interacts with the magnetic field of the Earth. OK, so just as we had the bar magnet having the field line, let me draw another little picture. We can have the same for the Earth. So if we pretend that that's a little bar magnet in the centre of the Earth, we have field lines surrounding the Earth as well. OK. So here's the next question. And you can post in the chat, but I'll go through it as well. Which pole is the North Pole of the Earth, the magnetic North Pole of the Earth? OK. It might not be as obvious as you think. So if we think back to the compass, the North Pole of the compass, so the North Pole of the magnet in the compass, is attracted to what we call the North Pole of the Earth. But we've already said that North Poles are attracted to South Poles of magnets. So quite counterintuitively, perhaps, what we call the North Pole of the Earth, so the North Geographic Pole, is actually a magnetic South Pole. OK, I'll say that again. So the North Pole in the magnet of a compass points towards the North Geographic Pole. But because we know North Poles and South Poles attract, we know that the magnetic pole at the North Pole must actually be a South. So actually, this is the orientation of the magnet in the Earth. So we'd need to draw the field lines with the arrows pointing the other way. And this orientation of the magnet, of the magnetic field of the Earth, it can actually flip. So every 500, 700,000 years or so, typically, it can flip in orientation. So in 100,000 years, your magnets might not point north. They might, your compasses, they might point south. And this is just a natural thing that occurs. Brilliant. So I see some of you got that right in the chat. Excellent. So that's how compasses work. And that's a little bit about field lines. So we've been using the idea of magnets, like I say, for thousands of years, but we haven't really understood how they work until about the 1850s, when people were experimenting with electricity. Okay, so in particular, there's a notable experiment by one scientist called Hans Christian Ersted, who was doing some experiments with electricity. And he found that if he had electricity near a magnet, strange things started to happen. Okay, so I'm gonna try and illustrate this a bit for you now. So I'm going to put our compass back here. So the compass is going to act as the magnet here. And I've got what I've got here is I've got two batteries connected to a quite unruly long wire. So apologies if it takes a little while. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to connect this up and we're going to see what happens if I put the wire near the compass. Okay, so as you can see, this is going to make what we call a short circuit. So I'm not going to hold it for too long because the batteries are going to get very hot. If I line up, I'll try and get this to line up properly. This might take a few seconds. I need three hands for this, really. Okay. Leave that there. Okay. Promise it'll be worth it. There we go. So you can see that that is the wire is kind of aligning with the compass. If I then connect the batteries, do you see the compass needle move? So in three, two, one, I'm going to connect it. And again. So we can see that something, when I connect the circuit, when I allow electricity to flow through the wire, something is interfering with the magnetic field of the compass. So I'll connect it again and then release it. Okay, so just that simple experiment, that led Erster to start thinking about the relationship between electricity and magnetism and was the start of what we call electromagnetism. So combining the two, because what that showed is if we have electricity, it produces a magnetic field. 
So let's think about what electricity is. Okay, so electricity is the flowing of electrons. So these charged particles called electrons flowing through a wire. That is essentially what electricity is. So we can say that these moving charged particles, these moving electrons, are causing a magnetic field. Okay, but what does that have to do with our bar magnet here? So how does that apply? Because we've certainly not got a battery or a wire connecting up to this. Well, actually, to understand that, we have to look a little bit deeper into what actually makes up a bar magnet. Okay, so if we think about what makes up any, any object, anything we have, if we go really, really, really deep down into the material, we have atoms. So in this case, because it's a solid, we're gonna have atoms tightly packed in our bar magnet, okay? And if we zoom in even further, what are atoms made up of? Well, we have the central core, of the nucleus of an atom, which is made up of positive charged particles called protons and neutral charged particles, so no charge, called neutrons. We're, we're very, very clever at, at naming things as scientists, neutral neutrons, okay. And then surrounding that nucleus, we have electrons. So just like with the electricity, we have these negatively charged electrons, okay. and the thing with atoms is these electrons move within the atom so it's hard to describe exactly how they move there are lots of different models in physics with different levels so sometimes they're arranged in kind of rings and levels sometimes we think of them as just a cloud and they all kind of exist surrounding the nucleus you need to delve into quantum mechanics to fully understand how these electrons move and sit within the atoms but the point is, we've got moving electrons. So just like with the electricity, we have these moving electrons. So that means that every single atom has it a tiny little bit of magnetism. So every atom is a tiny little magnet. So if we think about that, so let's say our atom is this, we can think of our atoms as being a tiny little bar magnet. And we often represent this using arrows okay, to, to show which way that magnet is facing. So let's say, for example, the tip of the arrow would represent the north pole of a magnet. So if we think about all of our atoms in our bar magnet, well, the thing that makes these materials special and magnetic in the way that we understand them is that all of these bits of atomic magnetism line up facing in the exact same direction. So overall, we have quite a net resultant magnetic force. So we're adding up all these tiny little bits of atomic magnetism to get our bar magnet, okay? And that, this arrangement here, is what we call ferromagnetic. So you might recognize the ferro part of that, meaning iron. So the two are very, very closely linked. But this is what we call ferromagnetic. And that's the type of magnetism that you've probably studied in school. And that's what these bar magnets are. These are, there's iron in, in these and they are ferromagnetic. So all of those bits of atomic magnetism are lined up in the same direction. But that's not the only way they could be aligned, okay? so. The interesting thing about magnetism when we look at the atomic level is we need to look at the bigger picture. So just looking at one of these atoms, we couldn't say anything about overall whether that material would be magnetic or not. And a really good illustration of this, a really good example, is a material called chromium, okay? So chromium looks a bit like this, and it is, magnetic in the sense that its atoms, these magnetic atoms, are all aligned in a very ordered way. But does it stick to a magnet? Let's have a look. No. Okay, so something's going on here. The atoms inside chromium do have this magnetic order, so they are aligned, 
but not quite in the same way as the bar magnets are. In fact, they're aligned in such a way that each neighboring atom has its little bit of magnetism aligned in the opposite direction. So as you can see here, if we take an average, they all cancel out. So whereas we have this magnetic ordering, there's no net magnetism. And this is called anti-ferromagnetism. So anti in front there. So this really tells us that we need to look at the bigger picture when we're looking at magnetism. So we can look at what the individual atoms are doing, but that's not gonna tell us what's happening overall. And so if we think more generally, in every material, so every atom has this tiny bit of, of magnetism. And in what we would consider typically non-magnetic materials, these atoms, the magnetic atoms are just aligned in completely random directions. Okay, so again, just like with the anti-ferromagnetic chromium, these would all cancel out to zero, okay? But if we put these materials in a very strong magnetic field, so we put them next to a very strong magnet, we can sometimes get all of these little atoms to align. So we get that magnetic ordering, but that's only in the presence of a strong magnetic field. So this can happen in two different ways. So let's put our strong magnet here and I'm going to label the ends here north and south so we can have them all aligning to point towards the magnet or we can have them aligning to point away from the magnet so we can see now because we've made these atoms order themselves we have a net magnetism for the material. And what happens here is if you remember, so we had the arrow representing the north and south like that. So in this case, we've got the north pole of these little atoms. It's gonna be attracted to the magnet, okay? And this is what we call paramagnetism. Okay and copper sulfate is an example of something that is paramagnetic. And I'm gonna show you that in a second. Okay. And here we have the opposite. So here it's repelled and this is called diamagnetism. And like I say, these are only in the presence of a strong magnetic field. Okay. And Surprisingly, I'm going to show you that water is actually diamagnetic. Okay, so water is magnetic. So obviously we are, what, 60, 70% water. So by extension, we are magnetic. Okay, so let me just get this set up and I can show you this live. So what I'm going to do is I need to set up a tray filled with water because I want to set these samples able to move. So they're going to float on some water. Okay. So I promise there's nothing, nothing fancy going in. This is just a Pyrex jug of water. Just add another one to get it high enough for water level. Okay. And then I've just got a piece of polystyrene that I'm going to float on top here. Okay. So I'll show you the copper sulfate first. So remember I showed you it's this, this blue crystal here. Now copper sulfate is also a little bit of an irritant. So you shouldn't hold it for too long. So I'm going to pick it up very quickly. And also you need to, if you do touch this and use it at school, which you can, you can grow this sometimes in your chemistry classes. Um, you need to make sure not to rub your face or your eyes or something with your fingers. So I'm just going to quickly pop that on. It's also very soluble in water, so it's very important I don't drop this in the water. Otherwise, that would be a shame. Okay. And then what I can do is I can get my magnet. So I said it needs a strong magnet. This, it just needs a fairly strong magnet, nothing incredibly strong. So this magnet that I was using earlier will do. And 
So what did we say? So we said that copper sulfate was paramagnetic, so it's going to be attracted to the magnet. So let's see if I can get this to work. It might take a little second to get going. You can see I'm not touching it. I'm also not blowing on it. I'm facing my other camera. And you can see it's being attracted to the magnet. It's quite a weak effect, so it takes a little while. But you can see it's being pulled towards the magnet. Okay, and I'll try and get it to go in another, another direction. Come on. So like I say, it's only in the presence of a strong enough magnetic field do all the little bits of atomic magnetism line up inside the copper sulfate in such a way that it is attracted to a magnet. There we go. And like I say, you can easily do this in schools if, if you have some copper sulfate samples. And this, this is just a, you can buy magnets of this strength. It's just a neodymium magnet, so a rare earth magnet. It's a bit stronger than the, uh, the red and blue bar magnets, but it's still very easily accessible. So you could do this in school. Okay, so I'm gonna put away my copper sulfate. There we go. And make sure not to touch my face. And now I'm going to show you water. So what did we say? I told you that water was the opposite. So it was diamagnetic. So this means that if I put a strong magnet nearby, it will repel it. So I'm just gonna fill up this little plastic tube with water and place it on here. So for this, I need a slightly stronger magnet, which I'm keeping on the floor away from my phone and my laptop because I don't want bad things to happen there. Okay, so I've got a bit of a stronger magnet here because this is a much weaker effect. Obviously, we don't walk around getting stuck to magnets all the time. So this is, this is a much weaker effect, so I need a stronger magnet. But we should hopefully see, let me get this right. Okay, so this should start being repelled. There we go. So can you see again, I'm not touching it, I'm not blowing on it, promise. And that is being repelled from the magnet. So water is magnetic. So theoretically, if we had a strong enough magnet, we could be repelled from a magnet and we could float. And actually, in principle, this is how MRI scanners work. So if you've ever had an MRI scan at a hospital, that exploits this idea of water being magnetic. And you have really, really strong magnetic fields being produced by superconducting wires in an MRI machine that cause the water molecules in our bodies to align in a certain way that it can then be imaged. Okay. So that was water. So that was diamagnetic. So that's how the, um, so I'm just trying to read the chat whilst I'm doing this. So I'll get to your questions at the end um, once you have a chance to have a look at the app that I'm going to show you in a minute. Um, so in this case with the water, all the little atoms inside are aligning in such a way that they oppose the magnetic field, so they're repelling. Like I say, we are magnetic. And I have another demo, I think I've got time, to show you, which is also really fun. Another everyday material here. Oh, let me get this out. Oh, I need a small one. There we go. So what I have here is a piece of graphite, otherwise known as pencil lead. So every single pencil has this in. And graphite actually behaves in a very similar way to water. Okay? So what I'm going to do here now, and I will need to move the little visualizer camera that I've got to show you properly, but I'm going to essentially float this graphite on some magnets. 
I don't, you probably can't see it there. You might be able to, but I'm going to show you it a bit closer up over here. So if we just get a few seconds. Hopefully the video might cut out, but it all it's behaving today. That's good. Sorry. There, can you see that it's not quite touching? Let me see if I can focus it a bit better. There we go. So you can see the graphite is floating over the magnets. Very, very slightly. Again, another very, very weak effect. And this is something that you can also see, and I mentioned it a minute ago in MRI machines, but with superconductors. So you might have heard superconductors. They have much stronger magnetic levitation properties. But unfortunately, I can't show you a superconductor at home because, well, as you can probably tell, I am doing this in my, in my office at home. And superconductors require something very, very, very cold called liquid nitrogen to cool them down enough. There we go, for them to actually be superconducting. So unfortunately, I can't show you that today. But if you Google or look on YouTube for magnetic levitation and superconductors, you can find some amazing videos for that. And that's a much stronger effect than graphite. But it's essentially the same thing. It's this diamagnetism. So with the magnetic field, the atoms aligning to oppose that magnetic field. So hopefully that was some fun little demos. Um, so what I've got now is, you've heard me mentioning uh, a website that we've got. So someone in the department has made an app to explore magnetic fields. So this is what this website looks like. So as you can see here, we've got a couple of magnets that have been spawned. And you can see, like I mentioned before, the field lines. So these arrows represent the field lines and you can see them coming here. So in this case, they've got the colors the other way around. The colors are completely arbitrary, okay? Field lines go from north to south, but here the colors are switched. Don't let that confuse you though. Like I say, the color is, we just decide we want to paint one end red and one end blue. Um, the physics is the same, I promise. Um, and what each of these magnets are is they are like a little magnet on a pivot. So I have one here, that's a little arrow and these magnets can pivot around. So if I've got a bar magnet here, I can make it move around. Okay. And so to do this, you can click on the magnet and move it around. And you can click and hold it to hold it in position. So here I've moved one round and the other one has flipped because again, like poles repel, opposite poles attract. And you can do the same and you can let it go and then they'll both start moving. Okay. And so you can have a play with this. When you first open the website, it'll probably look uh, something a bit like this. So it's got a, a grid of magnets and you can see how they're all trying to move just slightly to come into kind of what we call equilibrium. So that sort of balanced position. And so you can see what happens if you try and rotate one and then let it go. And you can see what the field lines are doing. So the slightest bit of disturbance has a knock on effect on all the other magnets. Okay. So have a play with the, uh, the magnetic fields and see if you can complete a few challenges. So there's instructions at the bottom of the page on how you kind of spawn the magnets. So if you press one, you get that pair. Let me click on it again. You, you get the pair that I showed you to begin with. If you press two, you get a row of magnets. So here, see if you can get them all to flip in the opposite direction. That's my challenge for this one. See if you can get them all to flip over. More tricky than you might think, more tricky. And then if you press three, you get that grid. And if you press four, you get a new magnet appearing where your mouse is. So I'm gonna cause chaos with all my magnets here. Okay, so they've got two challenges. So like I say before, see if you can make all the magnets flip. So either in this array or this array, 
see if you can get them all to flip direction. And then the second challenge is a bit more fun. What's the funnest arrangement of atom of magnets that you can come up with? So I managed to make a smiley face. So see if you can think of anything funner to do. So have a play with that and I will answer some questions if I can uh, while you're doing that. Let me know if you have any problems with the website as well. It might take a little while to load. You might need to click on it. Um, I haven't tested it on an iPad, but hopefully it should still work. And I'm just running it in uh, Chrome in my browser. It didn't need to download any special add-ons. So fingers crossed it would still work. Um, but it'd be good to know if it didn't. I don't have an iPad, so I didn't, I wasn't able to check. Um, but fingers crossed. Okay, so I see there's a few questions in the Q&A. Okay, thinking back to the copper sulfur, sulfate experiment, um, asking, does, does that show that it has a magnetic field? So that's an interesting question. And again, it comes back to thinking about the arrangement of the atoms inside. So normally, so as I was saying, it, when, it's, when the copper sulfate's just in its little tub like this, the atoms, the, the, the magnetic uh, direction of all the atoms are just kind of randomly oriented. So it doesn't have a magnetic field at this point. Okay. It's only when it's in the presence of that stronger magnet that causes all the atoms to align that then generates its own magnetic field and the two magnetic fields interact and that's what caused it to be attracted to the other magnet. So it's only when another magnet or another magnetic field causes the atoms to align that the copper sulfate then has its own magnetic field. Like this, it doesn't. So it's a special effect in that sense, but that's a good question. I hope that made sense. <laughs> it's quite difficult to explain. Can you please repeat the sentence you said about north in geography? Yes. So when I was talking about uh, how compasses work, yeah, that's quite confusing to get your head around, but I'll go through it again. Um, good question. So the, if we have our compass, the north, so the compass is basically a magnet that's free to pivot and that's strong enough to interact with the Earth's magnetic field because the Earth's magnetic field is pretty weak, okay? And what happens is the North Pole of the magnet in the compass is attracted to what we call the North Pole of the Earth, okay? But we know that in for magnets, a North Pole is attracted to a South Pole, so for magnets yet we say that the north pole of a magnet points towards the north pole so we know that's that can't be true for magnets so in fact what we call the north pole otherwise known as the north geographic pole is actually a south pole of a magnet because the north pole of a compass is attracted to it so the north pole of the compass is attracted to a south pole at the top of the earth i hope that makes sense it's quite a confusing one to get your head around, but I feel like once you start thinking about what poles are attracted to what for magnets, it starts to make sense. Does the compass point to the North Geographic Pole? Yes. Yes, that's right. For now. <laughs> but yes, that's true. So the compass points to the North Geographic Pole, which is actually a magnetic South Pole. So I keep using these words geographic and magnetic to try and separate the two. So I think that's probably the best way to think about those. Where will magnetic field lines go inside the magnet? So that's a good question. So they, the way we draw them, they don't just suddenly magically stop uh, at the outer edge of the magnet. So that's a really good point. Um, they do go through the... Um, Oh, I've got the water bath here now, so I can't draw things. Um, they go through the magnet. So if you remember, I said that all of the atoms inside the these bar magnets, for example, all lined up. So north, south, north, south, north, south. So we said that field lines go from a north to a south. So essentially, in, in the center of the bar magnets, the field lines just kind of go in straight lines through the center. And then it's only when they come out the side that, that they want to be attracted back to a south pole so then they get the curved shape so i hope that answers that question but yeah that's a good point they don't just magically stop they do run throughout the magnet but obviously because field lines are just our way of 
trying to visually represent what's going on inside, we don't really tend to draw them going straight through the magnet, but good point. So we've got an interesting question here again about the Earth. So how can the Earth's magnetic field come from the core if temperatures are so hot? Doesn't this destroy magnetism? So that is that is a good point. And um, because obviously we can't get into the center of the Earth, we're not 100% sure exactly how the Earth's magnetic field um, is maintained or exists. We think it's to do with the molten iron particles um, within the core. Um, but obviously there's no way we can, you know, kind of test that theory because um, we can't get to the center of the earth despite what sci-fi films would like us to believe. Um, so that is a good question and high temperatures can um, affect magnetism because it goes back to that idea of the atoms being ordered. So if you think about what heat actually is, it's, vib it's atoms or particles vibrating. So if you get to a high enough temperature, the atoms would be vibrating too much to have that magnetic order still. So that is a good point. Someone's asked if I have a PhD and if I do, what is it in? Um, I'm actually still doing some research, um, not to get a PhD, but to get a master's uh, by research. And my specialty is not in magnets, actually, it's in atmospheric physics. So I study the Earth's atmosphere and climate um, and the sort of physics that influences that. Um, so it's something very different to magnetism. Um, but I did study for an undergraduate degree in physics. So I did learn all about magnets and superconductors and things like that as part of that. Um, so that is now what I'm working on with my uh, outreach work with the quantum materials group. So I'm combining two things that I've learned from physics. Uh, if you want a PhD in physics, what physics and maths do you need to study? The answer to that is any, any that you're interested in. So the idea, it's a good question. Um, so the idea to do a physics PhD, they're very, very, very specialized. So by that point, you've picked a very niche area to do some research in. Um, so you would need to do a broad, typically it's like a broad undergraduate degree in, in physics or maths, but it can be, you know, physics and astrophysics. Uh, it can be physics with maths, it could be physics with computer science, but anything that has that sort of physics uh, or maths or even chemistry. So physical chemistry um, is very easily applicable. I know several people who've, uh, who have done a PhD in physics who actually did a chemistry undergraduate degree. Um, same with biology. So any sort of science, because um, like I say, by the time you get to a PhD, it's very specialised. Some good books related to quantum physics. So there are the Oxford Very Short Introduction series. I highly recommend. There's ones, I think there's one on quantum physics or quantum theory generally. There's also ones on magnetism. There's ones on superconductors. Um, pretty sure there's probably one on string theory, if that person is still here. Um, so the very short introduction theory uh, uh, series. What have I got on my bookshelf? Um, I think the one that I read at school was one called In Search of Schrodinger's Cat um, by John Gribbon. That was cool, um, but certainly the very short introduction. Oh, and there's one, I think it's How to Teach Quantum Physics to Your Dog, I think is one. There's a quantum physics one and a special relativity one. They're fun. So I hope that was interesting and uh, feel free to keep using the, the app that might help you with the uh, schoolwork, potentially helping you understand about magnetic fields. Um, um, thank you so much for joining me and I hope you enjoyed it. Mm -hmm.